Hi, this is Graphic Content and I'm Dave. Jack's reviews will be up shortly. This month we're going to give our own reports on some European comics that have either sat on our shelves for a while or are fairly new to us. Either way, something about these works stuck out to us and we're here to share them with you. So the first book that I'm going to talk about is this one, Peplume by a prolific French author who goes simply by the name of Bluch. Peplume was first written in serialized form in the mid-1990s, and this beautiful English edition book uh, by the New York Review of Books, uh, which I believe uh, their imprint, the New York Review of Comics, this is called, uh, collects all of the chapters from that serialized version and includes some additional material. Uh, it's a striking, a striking, sprawling, epic work that encapsulates life in ancient Rome through a main character, a young man who is at the lowest rung of the Roman hierarchy. Paplum isn't even his name, but it's one stolen following a jealous murder that occurs early in the book. Paplum is driven mad by obsession, and he's soon thrust from the Roman coast and into countrysides and cities that are ravaged by war and plague, all of which he observes from a careful distance, until his own impetuousness puts him into the action, often with very dire consequences. Bluch's line quality recalls expressionist woodcuts at the erratic moments in the story and fine etchings at other slower moments. In battle scenes or in scenes that require a lot of action, the line quality takes on an expressiveness. It's as if the, the brush strokes were leaping off the page. Um, and I really appreciate these, these moments in the book. Um, there's such a intense uh, like action painting quality to them. Paplume has uh, these loud and soft kind of cadences throughout, so it, it, it feels very musical, like an opera or a concert that's peppered with plenty of sex and violence as the main character with his stolen identity moves from scene to scene. Indeed, Paplume's stolen identity leads to some very dire consequences right up to the end of the story. Uh, personally, I'm not familiar with the Satyricon, uh, off of which the author has said this is based, uh, except for the Fellini version uh, in his film. So I can't really speak to how faithful it is or isn't to the source material, but this version, Bluch's version, is a personal struggle of one individual who is seeking an elusive idea, in this case, ideal beauty, and the destructive paths that obsessions can forge. Uh, as an artist myself, I admire Bluch's consistency and dedication to the story. The tone really doesn't waver. Um, it flows very naturally. It's not humorless, but you have to really, really look through the cracks to find the humor. Uh, you can actually feel the sweat and the smell of the crowds, the claustrophobia of packed ships and prisons. The most satisfying moments, uh, for me, I'm a story guy, uh, seem to be the quiet poetic ones that lead into a scene where the narration is often Paplume's observations or no narration at all. As the book ends, Paplume's fortunes change. With each turned page, the action really speaks up. He loses his young charge and lover. His false identity is found out. His impotency is cured in an act of violence, which wins him over to some elites, some Roman elites. So he's in their crowd now. Uh, secrets are overturned, but not Peplum's overarching melancholy. And indeed, the final panel shows uh, a grown Peplum sitting among Roman elites. He's one of them now, and he silences their laughter as he vividly describes a harrowing act of desperation and violence. <laughs> the next book is tonally and geographically very different from Peplum. Uh, Eric the Red, King of Winter by Soren Mosdal. And it's drawn with very sharp angles and mask-like expressions uh, that are made to match a harsh, unforgiving setting of Greenland around the year 1000. Uh, the title character, Eric the Red, uh, isn't a conqueror as much as he is an exile for having murdered his neighbors over some bedposts of all things in a fit of rage. 
uh, resentful of this exile, he lives in near isolation with his wife and grown sons until that uneasy peace is disrupted by a priest who arrives with Eric's grown son who is overseas apparently with this priest. Uh, and the son's name is Leif. This sets up the most interesting plot point, I think, in the book. Uh, the idea of the upstart Christianity supplanting the more ancient Nordic religions, uh, Norse religions, excuse me. As the story unfolds, we learn that Leif has been converted to the new Christian religion, as well as Eric's wife, uh, Jod Hild, who insists that they build a church on the hillside. Eric's luck continues to slide as a journey with his eldest son, Thornstein, is thwarted when Eric throws his back falling off a horse just before the journey, so he can't go on the journey with Thornstein. Thornstein then dies, having to have uh, ventured out without his more experienced father to a newly discovered island, um, and they were going to this island in a bid to beat Leif, uh, his brother and Eric's son, to the claim. Eric's list of allies uh, grows shorter, uh, and they're limited to Turkir, who's a Moorish spy, whose allegiance is constantly questioned throughout the book, and Farsirk, who is a strong warrior who has a visit from the god Odin that makes him an even uh, a more formidable warrior. Um, honestly, the story lost me at a few crucial points. Uh, the exposition at the beginning, I think it required a little more subtlety uh, instead of just the, the pushing of plot and the piling on of characters that the author chose to do. Um, it feels to me like an early work or a labor of love and as such has a quality that many side projects or projects that are worked on a little longer than they should maybe uh, do. An inconsistent drawing style and a rushed kind of enigmatic ending. Um, the story does have an uneven quality and the ending isn't even all that satisfactory. But having said that, the streamlined graphic quality and the flat colors help to create tension and a sense of isolation. Um, it's a mood that really matches the, the story very well. Uh, in the book's moments of rage, panels go completely red or yellow, mirroring the violent nature that these warriors resort to often. Um, it helped, in my reading of it, that I had just listened to Neil Gaiman's audiobook on Norse mythology. I think it's actually called Norse mythology. Um, I picked up on the references to Odin being one-eyed, uh, as well as references to the Midgard serpent uh, that protects um, Valhalla, uh, or Asgard, excuse me. The Christians speak Latin when they need to invoke their god, and the Greenlanders speak in a series of symbols when they need to theirs. Um, which is a really enjoyable motif. Going back to what I mentioned earlier, this harkens back to the real story here, uh, the meat of the story, the clash of religions in a harsh land. Uh, where both sides know that whoever wins over the souls of the people will ultimately survive. And finally, there is Joan Cornella, a Spanish satirist whose work is along the lines of, if you're familiar with Johnny Ryan, Ivan Brunetti, and Tim Hensley. Uh, unlike those artists, Cornella works in a rigid six-panel grid and with friendly hand-painted colors invoking children's books and commercial top styles of illustration. Uh, what gives Cornella's work such teeth is the inclusion of an often shocking set of sequences between the first and the last panels, which gives the reader a jolt. Uh, depending on your own personal sense of humor, you'll, you'll either laugh at these uh, you'll laugh yourself stupid, or you'll throw the book across the room and, and douse it with holy water. Uh, a lot of the gags involve people with permanent smiles etched on their faces coming across, or often initiating an act of violence, um, which elicits an unexpected reaction. Um, and that sounds, as I say that, it sounds like the dictionary definition of irony. Um, except it feels like more than that. It feels like uh, a point that we're past. Um, the passive smiling faces are ones that we recognize from commercial illustrations, you know, everything from IKEA instructions to airplane safety cards. And, uh, but Cornella just isn't someone out for shock value alone. Um, and I feel that this collection of work is uh, much smarter than that. Uh, consumerism, the American fixation on guns, uh, race relations, gender roles, religion, the internet, celebrity culture, all of it is fair game in this book. 
and reading this collection uh, called Mox Nox, uh, and I'm not sure what that means, uh, it, can, it, it made me appreciate also what can be done in a six panel format. Uh, in some ways, it feels like the natural evolution of the comic strip, the vaudeville gags that informed the strips at the onset of the medium, and the radio plays and then sitcoms that informed the next wave of strips have given way to this, uh, a strip that no newspaper would dare dream of publishing for fear of the backlash. Um, and it's just inappropriate. Uh, informed by the, uh, and th the work is informed by the constant stream of often unfiltered information in our current age. Um, so if your sense of humor is uh, unfiltered enough and safe enough to withstand it, pick up Mox Knox by Joan Cornella. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode. Um, and I decided to take on a classic, The Black Island by Hergé. Um, this is just one in the many adventures of the Adventures of Tintin. Uh, and I picked this one out because I think it's one of the strongest works from the series. Uh, it's the seventh volume by Belgian cartoonist Hergé. It was originally commissioned by the conservative Belgian newspaper Le Vignette Cécile for its children's supplement, and it was drawn from April to November 1937. In it, Tintin travels to England in pursuit of a gang of counterfeiters. He's framed for theft and hunted by detectives Thompson and Thompson. Tintin follows the crime lords to Scotland, discovering their lair on a black island. In 1943, it was redrawn and used color in Hergé's distinctive Lingler Clair, uh, French for a clear line, which uses clear, strong lines, all the same width and no hatching, while contrast is played down. This t term was coined by Jost Swart in 1977. The, the characters are cartoonish, while the settings are very realistic and drawn from reference. Then in the mid-1960s, British publishers requested a new revision to the story. This sent Hergé's assistant Bob Demore to England on a research trip. The third edition includes reference shots from such places as La Coria Castle on the island of Oran in northern Scotland. This is kind of what makes t this series um, so fun to get into. It's drawn with the items and in the settings of its time period. The cars you see are cars that people drove in England at the time. A lot of the castles are from reference shots, appropriated and fictionalized, but from true settings. The Black Island also starts and marks the beginning of Hergé's more complete creative control. Prior to the Black Island, Hergé's editor was Norbert Wallace from 1929 to 1932. At this point at the newspaper, Wallace's message was pretty clear to Hergé. Make his comics anti-socialist, encourage colonial sentiment, and denounce American capitalism. But after he left, Hergé's comics became a lot more of the detective genre and fell out of the genre of satire. Hergé's first thought was to make satire and caricature of Nazi Germany in what would become King Ottoman Scepter. But then he started having dreams of the North in a car stuck in snow. He wanted to send Tintin north. This is what eventually became the plot to the Black Island. In the time period in which Tintin takes place, the 20th century, narrative is currency. He is a reporter who visits foreign lands, and his stories are almost always framed within self-referencing newspapers or archive. The end of Tintin comics usually happen with a newspaper, or begin with a newspaper article. In the earlier editions, such as in Tintin in the Land of the Soviets, it's blatant. But his adventures become more ironic and coincidental. The Black Island had a working title as The Forgers. This is a common enemy in Tintin, 
the forger, the copier, the duplicator, who decreases the value of an original. The broken ear is the earliest example. But mass production is always seen as problematic, such as in The Crab with the Golden Claws. Tintin Alpha Art, published in 1986 in Rough Draft after Hergé's death, was based on the Ferdinand Legros scandal of 1978. Legros was convicted of selling fake works of modernist art. So many to this day, a considerable amount of Matisse's and Dufoy's in collections and museums are forgeries. The Black Island falls into this category, but the object that's being counterfeited is money itself. Um, the Black Island is a mystery. Tintin reads books, parchments, scraps of crab tin label, and coded puzzles. Landscapes themselves become legible in the series. Tire and footprints left in earth and snow are what Tintin reads. Comics as a medium can turn language into things and things into language. Tintin's able to read both the images around him, the icons around him, and the words around him. As Tintin reads, others misread, such as Thompson and Tofton, Thompson, to hilarious ends. Tintin is principled, compassionate, but what makes him a hero is his power of observation. He doesn't just look, he really observes. This puts him in line with someone like a Sherlock Holmes. A more contemporary European title is Loïc Lacorot Kronowski's Pocahontas, Princess of the New World, translated by Sandra Smith. This historical fiction is told in three chapters and one epilogue. Each title's chapter is named after Pocahontas' name at the time. Modoka, Pocahontas, and Rebecca, each one showing a drastic difference in the historical figure's life. Lokotli Kornowski is a master of the medium. He barely ever leaves a two by three panel grid, which creates a rhythm in his narrative. The English translation by Sandra Smith flows. One wonders how it reads in its native tongue of French. Using camera angle and composition, he communicates with both words and pictures equally. Sometimes the panels are silent and the colonial Jamestown landscape feels quiet. You can really feel the isolation of the early colonists. The story somewhat falls in the same genre as Werner Herzog's movie, Aguari, The Wrath of God, or The Heart of Everything That Is, and other books that are historical fictions of early Native American cultures. Um, it feels extremely well researched with portrayals of Algonquin rituals and words. One really feels that they're in a different world as survival becomes a very important element in each character's motive. In the end, Pocahontas is a tragedy as Pocahontas attempts to converge different worlds in which she walks upon and ultimately fails in doing so. She thus isolates herself. It follows in the work of Hergé because the backgrounds are often extremely well rendered and the figures, like Tintin himself, are like simple emoji faces. Both of these books are really knockouts. <laughs> Uh, so that's it for this edition of Graphic Content. Uh, Jack and I thank you for watching. Uh, keep reading comics.